Welcome everyone again to another episode of the Idea Me Show, the show that profiles the human beings behind the really big ideas that are shaping our world, inspiring others, future creators, and for all those that like really great stories. Uh, I'm Ira Pastor, your aging health and longevity ambassador along for this journey. So on past shows, uh, we have touched on the topic of uh, systems biology, uh, the field of study that basically looks at the interactions between various components of biologic systems and how the these interactions ultimately give rise to function and behavior of a system, whether that uh, as we're talking about biologic processes like growth, development, aging, disease, degeneration. Uh, we've also spent some time talking on shows about the microbiome uh, and its connection, uh, either directly or via immunomodulation, immunosuppression, autoimmune effects that may occur from being exposed to uh, various components of the microbiome and the downstream effects on, on different diseases, including Alzheimer's and diabetes. And lastly, we've uh, also in the past talk, touched on the topic of uh, inflammaging, uh, this sort of chronic progressive increase in pro-inflammatory status across your body as you get older. Today, uh, we are going to continue sort of along the lines of the intersection of these themes uh, in relation to the topic of Parkinson's disease. So uh, Parkinson's disease uh, is a long-term degenerative disorder of the central nervous system affecting about estimated around 6 million people worldwide, which mainly affects the motor system. Uh, symptoms usually emerge slowly, uh, typically manifesting a shaking and rigidity, slowness of movement, difficulty walking. And this group of symptoms is collectively you know, defined as Parkinsonism or Parkinson's syndrome. Uh, the motor symptoms of the disease result typically from the death of cells in the substantia nigra, which is a region of the midbrain that uh, ultimately which results in not enough dopamine being produced. Uh, and the cause of cell death, while poorly understood, involves the buildup of certain proteins, including major one alpha synuclein, which we've spoken about before, into aggregates called Lewy bodies uh, in our neuron. Uh, and as this disease worsens, a variety of non-motor symptoms become more common in terms of problems with thinking, behavioral disorders, dementia. Uh, effects on sensory systems, sleep, emotional problems. It, it's really a horrific disease. And while the cause is currently unknown, uh, it's believed to involve both a combination of genetic and environmental factors. Uh, people with family members that are affected are most likely to get the disease. There's, a, there's an increased risk in people exposed to certain pesticides, uh, as, low, as well as those who might have head injuries. And paradoxically, there's some reduced incidence in, in tobacco smokers and people who drink lots of coffee. Anyway, our guest today, uh, is I'm, I'm really excited because they're going to take us further down the path of some fascinating new theories uh, that in certain cases, uh, Parkinson's disease, this horrific degenerative central nervous system disorder, may actually not arise in the central nervous system at all, but in the intestinal system and ultimately migrate there uh, to the brain. Dr. Pierre Borghammer is clinical professor in the Department of Clinical Medicine and Nuclear Medicine and Positron Emission Tomography Center at Aarhus University in Denmark. Uh, with both a, an MD and a PhD in neuroscience from Aarhus, Dr. Borghammer specializes in a variety uh, of neurobiological research areas, including the study of Parkinson's disease, atypical Parkinson's, other neurodegenerative brain disorders, both the pathophysiology and the imaging. Uh, the imaging of the parasympathetic nervous system, uh, the imaging of the cholinergic signaling processes that occur in other pathologies, such as certain cancers and chronic inflammation. Uh, he was recently awarded by the European Association of Nuclear Medicine, the Marie Curie Award uh, for visualizing the parasympathetic denervation in Parkinson's disease. Uh, Dr. Borgammer, thank you so much for taking the time to come on the show today and talk. Thank you. It's my pleasure. Great. Great, nice having you. Um, so to, to start off, before we get into the subject, we typically give our guests the floor just to, to talk a little bit about you, uh, introduce you know, who you are, where you grew up, how you got interested in science, uh, medicine, and ultimately uh, how you find yourself at this epicenter of, of neuroscience, nuclear medicine, and sort of the pathophysiology of these, these various conditions. Yeah, right, it's a bit of a... A long story, of course. I'll try to keep it short. So, uh, you know, after my high school days, uh, I kind of uh, had, you know, I knew that I either wanted to become a medical doctor or an astrophysicist. Mm. Uh, so I had to pick between those two, and uh, I, I chose uh, uh, medicine. Uh, although since then I have had 
I'm still very interested in, in, in all sorts of scientific topics like, uh, like uh, cosmology, but also, you know, other stuff. So anyway, uh, off to med school, became a doctor, and then I quickly realized that I wanted to, to be a neurologist because I find the brain to be the most fascinating organ and, and also, you know, probably because uh, there's so little known about it. Uh, and also it's the seed of cognition and the self and everything. So kind of that philosophical bent. So uh, I wanted to become a neuro neurologist. So I did a PhD in Parkinson's disease with positron emission tomography. Uh, I didn't know what that technique was at the time. So I started the PhD and I became intensely fascinated about these techniques, these, uh, uh, you know, fairly novel imaging techniques, uh, PET, SPECT, MRI and so forth. And uh, I kind of spent my PhD arguing, uh, uh, you know, whether I still wanted to be a neurologist or whether I should actually pursue a career in, in imaging, which would also leave me more time for research because uh, clinical neurologists are extremely busy and mm -hmm. uh, they have little time for research. Uh, and whereas in, in imaging, you know, specialities, sometimes there's a bit more time. So, so that's how I ended up is, as, a, as a nuclear medic rather than a neurologist, although I'm still kind of a neurologist by heart, mm. uh, if you know what I mean. So, um, yeah, and, you know, the, the first project was Parkinson's disease, I, uh, and I found that disease to be so intensely fascinating that I just keep study, studying it ever since. Along those lines, before we get into your Parkinson's work, could you briefly go into sort of, uh, you know, here we are in 2019, sort of the, you know, we talk a lot about therapeutic interventions on the show. We don't talk as much about diagnostics. And I think the, the topic of imaging and nuclear medicine is, is very fascinating. Can you sort of explain to the audience a little bit of sort of where we are with these technologies? Uh, you know, we hear so much about uh, things on the therapeutic side, like uh, artificial intelligence and machine learning that'll help us design new drugs. Talk a little bit about some of these new tools as, as they pertain to imaging. Okay, so actually, uh, these two, the diagnostics and the therapies actually, you know, go very much hand in hand. And now more than ever, because of, you know, the new concept of, well, fairly new, of personalized medicine or, you know, uh, these sorts of things, targeted uh, therapies, mm -hmm. uh, you know, <clears throat> we are now at the cusp of a new era where we will be much better at finding individual patients who benefit from a specific treatment, whereas the other people with the same disease, at least we think, uh, they won't because they have some other gene, they have some other receptor or whatever that, that, that for, and for, for that reason, they, 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 are not, uh, they, they won't benefit from that uh, therapy. So how do we find these two subtypes of a disease? Well, that's when uh, uh, all sorts of imaging and perhaps especially molecular imaging comes in because what molecular imaging can do is basically you have a radioactive um, a ligand, a pharmaceutical, if you will, you inject mm -hmm. that in the body. And for instance, it has a specificity to a certain receptor uh, on a cancer. And if you can see that this particular person has a cancer with a, an abundance of those receptors, well, then you kind of know that that person will probably benefit from the therapy that targets that receptor. Whereas you have, you have another patient with the same cancer, but that patient is receptor negative. Uh, so therefore, the, the therapy won't work, um, and 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 basically, uh, basically that kind of sums up uh, at least one of the very kind of powerful uh, um, um, potentials in molecular imaging that 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 we are able to in vivo uh, study the patient at the molecular level, whereas with you know, other techniques like MRI and CT, ultrasound, mm -hmm. they, these techniques are very good at looking at anatomy, mm -hmm. but they can't really study the person at the receptor level or the molecular level. Sure. Moving into the, the theme of Parkinson's disease, so can you give us a little bit of background of sort of when and how this idea that, you know, Parkinson's disease, which you know, studied for decades now, was you know, mainly being uh, something that's focused on the, the stuff inside our skull. But the, the concept that, hey, this may not be starting 
in the brain as we think, but actually may be starting in the gut. You, can you talk about sort of the, the initial evidence and the studies behind this and ultimately how your work uh, contributed to um, further validating a theory of this nature? So um, as is always the case, there, were, there has been, you know, small papers and observations here and there in the last, uh, in the 20th century, but nobody really kind of connected the dots. So uh, the, the theory actually stems from, you know, 2003, so it's like 15 years old. Mm -hmm. A German neuropathologist called Heiko Brack, uh, he studied uh, more than 100 brains from, uh, from dead patients. And he kind of just simply looked at it, how is the pathology distributed throughout the brain? And he kind of, you know, <clears throat> pulled, pulled all of that observations together and he concluded that it seems like the pathology is, the earliest pathology is basically at the entrance gate of the brain, if you will. So the olfactory bulb, our smelling nerve, and also a particular nucleus at the bottom of the brainstem, uh, a parasympathetic nucleus, it, 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 it's a particular set of neurons that sends very long nerve fibers to all over the body. So you, could, you can say that it's kind of the entrance uh, gate uh, into the brain, if you will. And then he very quickly realized that, well, if, if, the, if, you know, if the entrance gate is the first to be hit, uh, well, then probably it doesn't start in the brain. Then it probably starts outside the brain because then it would immediately make sense that those particular nuclei and not you know, one of a thousand other nuclei inside the brain was the first to be hit. Mm -hmm. So basically, that was the idea the, uh, the, uh, that he kind of conjectured or postulated based on, on post-mortem studies. Ever since then, we have been uh, trying to find ev uh, evidence. Uh, you know, immediately, you know, it makes sense because we know that Parkinson patients very often lose their sense of smell mm -hmm. 10 years, 20 years before diagnosis. So that is mm -hmm. a very early symptom that comes way before the motor symptoms. Mm -hmm. Similarly. Uh, many patients get constipation uh, and other bowel problems, you, uh, also problems with the, uh, with the bladder and voiding and so on. That can also happen 10, 20 years before diagnosis. So these symptoms from the peripheral nervous system are actually very early in, in a significant fraction of the patients. So that kind of fits with that the periphery is sick before the brain is sick. Yeah, so... That, uh, that 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 kind of sums up the kind of the initial uh, the initial uh, phase of that uh, transition, if you will. Excellent. And uh, <clears throat> you know, uh, we we have done several studies to uh, to kind of um, so to find supports and evidence. Okay. I'll just sum that up briefly. Sure. One study one study we did was that we found um, tissue gastrointestinal tissue, so gut tissue from Parkinson patients. But the point is that this tissue was, uh, was in biobanks and okay. it, had been, it had been removed from the patients up to 20 years before they had the diagnosis of Parkinson's disease. Wow. So basically the tissue is in a time capsule, if you will. It okay. was 25 years old. And we know that the patient got the diagnosis of Parkinson's disease 20 years after the removal. Mm. So we located that tissue and we were able to show that in more than 50% of the cases, uh, we could find the Parkinson pathology, the Lewy pathology in the enteric nervous system of the gut up to 20 years before diagnosis. So that's a pretty solid evidence that the, that the, uh, that the, that the gut is you know, affected by the Parkinson's pathology many, many years before the patient actually starts getting the motor symptoms. So that's, that's one bit of evidence. And, and another, another uh, bit was a, a, a large you know, nationwide registry study we did, so an epidemiological study. Okay. And that idea was, again, very simple because <clears throat> Uh, well, a, a, an integral part of the gut first hypothesis is that, you know, if it starts in the gut, then it can enter the brain through a very certain nerve called, called the vagus nerve. It's kind of the longest nerve we have in the body, if, you know, to a certain extent. 
Uh, and it's um, at the end of that uh, nerve is that entrance door that this German neuropathologist had pinpointed 15 years ago. You know, at the end of that nerve, that is where you see this vagal nucleus, and we know that that's the first place you see the pathology in many patients. Okay, so our idea was, well, if we can find patients who have had a surgical section so of that nerve, so the nerve is cut, it's not there anymore. So if you have had that surgery, well, then you should be protected against Parkinson's disease. If it is true that the pathology started down here and uses this nerve as a highway to get into the brain, if it is cut, then you're protected. And it just so happens that decades ago, if you had an ulcer in your stomach, uh, the, one of the classical therapies was to cut this nerve. That was before it was realized that it was just a, you know, a, a bacteria and you right. needed a bit of antibiotics to get rid of your ulcer. They didn't know that, so the best thing they could do was to cut the nerve. Hmm. And many, many thousands of patients had this surgery. So we located these patients in the registries and we compared them to the background population. And we found that, uh, that this section of the nerve uh, reduces your risk of Parkinson's by up to 50%. Um, and and that's, that's quite striking. Um, and, and of course, these, these patients had the surgery done in the 70s and 80s and 90s, and then we had up to th more than 30 years of, of follow-up of these patients in the registry. So we really had a long time to see if they, if they actually converted to Parkinson's disease or not. Yeah, so that's, that's two of the studies we've done to, to support the idea. I, I didn't know that history about, I mean, I knew the history about the ulcers, but I, I didn't realize that people had their vagal nerves cut for that purpose. But that's, uh, I, I guess, a great biologic resource for, uh, for you uh, to, to do this exploration. So, um, so you know, okay, so you, you use the term gut first, um, Parkinson's theories. But then, you know, you, I think often you've also talked about that, you know, there's brain first. Um, so that maybe not all cases uh, are this route. Can you talk about sort of the difference in you know, what, what sort of brain first Parkinson's disease is all about and how, you know, why they may, that may still exist with the, the other hypothesis, what makes it different? Yeah, so, okay, um, it's, it's actually been, you know, this, this concept in a way has been around for, for quite some years. And again, it's based on post-mortem <clears throat> studies of the brain from dead patients. So several neuropathologists have kind of seen that in some Parkinson patients, uh, the brain stem, so the lower part of the brain, is most affected. Whereas in other patients, it seems like more you know, uh, systems inside the brain, something called the limbic system mm -hmm. uh, and also the cortex itself is more affected, whereas the brainstem is less affected. Mm -hmm. So there's, so, so neuropathologists have been talking about this brainstem predominant versus the limbic or neocortical predominant uh, Parkinson's disease, if you will. Uh, what, what they, what the pathologists haven't really kind of necessarily talked about was that that the brainstem predominant might then be actually the body first so it, it is the brainstem predominant because it comes mm. from outside and then it hits the brainstem whereas the other one well it probably starts inside the brain mm. but 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 anyway so that that has that has been around for for some time um <clears throat> i should say that you know uh, that in, in, in recent years, uh, at, at least some of the researchers discussing this issue perhaps tend to be a little bit black and white about it. So, you know, uh, so either, you know, either they, they think that uh, all cases of Parkinson's disease start in the gut, or mm -hmm. alternatively, zero cases of Parkinson's disease start in the gut. So mm -hmm. sometimes that's, you know, that can be how scientific discussions uh, <laughs> they are. Whereas, you know, it's perfectly reasonable to to think that well both th uh, scenarios might be true right. you know some patients some patients it starts in the gut some it starts uh, in the brain uh, yeah so so I, I should say that we we we, we published last year a, a, a very um, 
uh, I, you know, a quite advanced uh, imaging study where we used five different imaging modalities uh, with PET and SPECT and MRI. And using this combination, uh, we, we, we could basically stage the patient in, in living, you know, in, in real life, whereas that is usually something you have to wait until the patient dies. So basically what, what we did was we have, we have two measures to image the peripheral nervous system and then measures to, uh, to, 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 to assess the damage to the bottom of the brainstem and then to the top of the brainstem, the dopamine system. So in a way you could say it's stage one and two mm -hmm. and three. Um, so the, 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 the study we did last year, we handpicked a certain group of patients uh, they did not have the diagnosis of Parkinson's yet, but we have a strong suspicion that they will get it. And furthermore, that, they, that these patients are of the body first type. Okay? Mm. So we handpicked those patients, uh, 22 of those. And we did this comprehensive imaging battery. And what we found was that the peripheral nervous system was more or less completely destroyed. Mm. Uh, well, not probably not completely, but at least severe damage. Also, the pons, so the bottom of the brainstem, again, here we can see severe damage. Mm. But then when we came to the top of the brainstem, the patients looked normal. Uh, and we know that these patients, sooner or later, they will convert, many of them, to Parkinson's disease, meaning that the top of the brainstem will also be damaged. So, so what we found is this gradient, the periphery is damaged, but the brain is not. Uh, and that suggests that, that the pathology started in the periphery and has had plenty of years to you know, severely damage the periphery. And now what we see is this wave of spreading pathology going upwards. And in some years, the patients will convert to Parkinson's disease. Hmm. Yeah, so with that imaging battery, we have in a way kind of shown that this that we can find these body first patients in real life. Mm -hmm. And now currently we are studying another group of patients, uh, which we suspect are mostly of the brain first type. Uh, these are newly diagnosed Parkinson patients. So they have motor symptoms, but they just got the diagnosis. And then we image them with this battery. And then we see the exactly the opposite pattern. So the brain is sick, the dopamine system is severely damaged at the top of the brain, if you will, but the peripheral nervous system is much more normal. Hmm. So that gradient is the complete opposite of the other group we have seen. Right. And that suggests that what we can now find in real life are these patients with a body-first pathology and the others with a brain-first pathology. Well, focusing now, of course, on, on the body first then, um, uh, you know, as mentioned early on, we've, we've done other shows where we've talked about topics like the, the trillions of microorganisms that live within our gut. We've talked about things like inflammation and, and, and dysfunctional nutrient sensing and a variety. But I mean, there's a lot that obviously the gut is this whole other universe. It's this whole other cosmology in a way. Um, take us through your thoughts on the initiating sequence of events here in terms of gut first Parkinson's, because I'm sure there's, you're yes. studying a lot of things going on. Walk us through that if you would. Right. <clears throat> yeah. Um, uh, yeah. So this, this, uh, this topic is being intensely studied all over the world now, including by, by my group. Uh, we don't have any conclusive evidence yet, but you know, a lot of work is being done. Mm -hmm. So, uh, first of all, it's been shown in many, many studies now that the uh, microbiome, so the, the, the bacteria and so on in your stools, is uh, altered in Parkinson patients. So they have a different composition of their microbiome. Uh, that's no, there's no doubt about that. Whether what that means is not entirely sure yet. You know, basically, we don't know if the microbiome was the cause of the Parkinson's disease, mm. or alternatively, perhaps the Parkinson's disease came first and that also the microbiome. And this is very tricky to find out because as I saw, said before, most patients have a 20 year long prodromal phase. 
So if we really wanted to know these things, we should get stool samples from the patients, you know, 20, 30 years before their diagnosis to be absolutely sure about, you know, which came first, the disease or the microbiome changes. So, but people are trying to figure out how to circumvent that problem. Okay, so in, in animal studies and so on, several interesting things have, uh, have, been, uh, have been looked at. For instance, mm -hmm. we know that there's certain species of bacteria that can produce uh, certain proteins. These proteins, uh, uh, you know, the bacteria use them for a, a good purpose. They, they use them to make biofilms and so on. But what these proteins can do is that they can kind of misfold and aggregate into larger and larger aggregates of protein. And that kind of sounds a little bit similar to what we know happens in Parkinson's disease mm -hmm. and Alzheimer's disease, that we have this normal protein that misfolds and starts aggregating and spreading. So there's something kind of there's a similarity between the kind of the, the protein's behavior, if you will. And it has been shown that if you take these bacteria and you kind of you, you, you take this protein, this aggregating protein from the bacteria, and then you put it into a test tube. Mm -hmm. With the normal alpha synuclein protein from Parkinson's, you know, the, from, from humans, then this bacterial protein can actually start the aggregation process. Okay. Yeah. So, so you know, under normal circumstances, the alpha synuclein doesn't spontaneously aggregate, if you will, but if you add this bacterial toxin, if you will, then it immediately starts. So, that kind of suggests that the bacteria can secrete proteins that are fully capable of starting a Parkinson's disease pathology in the gut or in, mm -hmm. in the nervous system of the gut. Okay. So how might it, how might these bacteria actually get, you know, because usually they are, you know, they are outside the body, they are inside the gut, they're inside the intestine, but that's actually outside the body, yeah. even though it's on the inside, you know, but the, the, the gastrointestinal tube, you know, there's lots of defense mechanisms, because, you know, in place because we really don't want these bacteria inside the sterile body. We want to keep them out in the, out in the gut. However, you know, certain, certain people can get something called a leaky gut. Mm -hmm. So some of these defense mechanisms, if you will, they kind of start to break down so the gut is not so tightly regulated anymore. And it's been shown that when that happens, the bacteria and their proteins and so on, they have an easier time kind of breaking through the gut barrier and into the body itself. Mm -hmm. And as soon as they do that, the, well, the immediately they will get into contact with the enteric nervous system where the alpha synuclein is, and potentially they could start the, the Parkinson pathology in the enteric nervous system, which then spreads through the nervous system into the brain. Mm. So, so it's those sorts of uh, things we, we are looking at. Also, uh, like gastrointestinal inflammation in general is probably also a, a bad thing. It's been shown now that if you, uh, if you get repeated infections in, 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 the gastro, in, in, in the gut, that also increases your risk of Parkinson's disease. If you get inflammatory bowel disease like Crohn's disease or ulcerative colitis, that also increases your risk of Parkinson's disease. Mm -hmm. So it seems like all of these insults to, to the gut creates possibly an unhealthy environment, if you will, that increases the risk of this Parkinson's cascade getting started. Mm. And once it's started, you know, it can perhaps run out of control, spread through the nervous system, and then you have Parkinson's disease. Working off of that, now obviously it's early, <laughs> it's still speculative, but uh, clearly uh, once one moves beyond um, the current pharmacotherapeutic interventions, whether that's you know replacing dopamine or other neurotransmitters or some of the stuff going on in regenerative medicine with stem cells and so forth, it seems that now with this uh, sort of broader set of uh, pathophysiology, as you point out, uh, there may be all sorts of different interventions that, that can be given a look at, whether they're dietary, whether they're uh, pharmacotherapeutic to deal with inflammation, whether they're, and I'll, I'll, 
I will take my head. I, I don't know the possibilities, but could you talk just about, you know, what you're, you know, in the ideal world, looking out the next five, 10 years with this validated hypothesis, what are some of the interventions that you foresee uh, right. as ways to deal with X or not or gut first Parkinson's uh, right. model? Yes. So I would say that step number one currently is to keep piling up evidence uh, so we can become absolutely sure that at least some Parkinson patients that their disease started in, in the gut. You know, at, currently we are not 100% sure, but I would say that we are, we, are, we are starting to get there. So once we have established that, then, one, then, 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 then we can start thinking about, well, how can we at least prevent those, I mean, Parkinson's disease to even get getting started in, in that subset of patients. Uh, and obviously, uh, we would need to understand what kind of sets it in motion. As I just said, if it is true that a leaky gut is a bad thing, you know, well, then we should, then we should prevent people from, 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 you know, running around with a leaky gut. Uh, inflammation can also be uh, prevented. Um, at least, uh, you know, kind of kept, kept at bay. Uh, and of course, uh, altering the microbiome. So if we start to understand which type of bacteria is the most uh, risky, if you will, well, then, then we would need to start uh, thinking about getting rid of those bacteria, or at least, you know, perhaps taking a drug that can kind of um, inhibit whatever toxic protein or whatever uh, that, that these bacteria uh, secrete. Mm -hmm. uh, so uh, something like, um, of course, uh, fetal uh, transplants mm -hmm. are uh, currently being tested in the States, I believe. And I know a, a mm. Finnish colleague who also is starting to, to uh, he will be starting a, a study about this soon. Um, so, so basically, taking uh, the, the 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 fecal microbiome from uh, some person with a super healthy uh, gut uh, microbiome, and then transplanting it to 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 a patient who we know is at risk of getting Parkinson's disease. Uh, you know, all all of these uh, um, strategies uh, might work. Uh, you know, uh, mm -hmm. theoretically. Also, one, one thing that, that is, is, is very interesting is that, you know, currently, as we speak, pharmaceutical companies are trying to stop Parkinson's disease by treating with antibodies and small molecules that prevent the aggregation of this protein, alpha-synuclein. Mm. So uh, that is based on the idea that the aggregation and spreading of this protein is a bad thing is it is it's it's at the core of parkinson's pathology so that is what we need to prevent however there's a problem and that is that uh, when when we treat current the, the current patients they have parkinson's disease in the neurons inside the brain so that means if you that you need to cross the blood brain barrier which mm -hmm. is very, very tricky because right. the brain really doesn't want anything inside that it doesn't want, <laughs> right. if you will. So many, many drugs are being tried and many fail because they don't cross the brain barrier to a sufficient degree. In contrast, if it is true, if we can kind of prove that it is meaningful to prevent the aggregation of the enteric nervous system, that is much, much easier to treat. Absolutely. You know, especially orally. So if you take a pill and it, and it you know, passes your stomach, gets into the, the gut, it starts getting degraded and, and the drug is absorbed. Then the very first thing that, that the drug will get into contact with is basically the enteric nervous system. Right. Uh, and that even happens before the first pass through the liver because mm. everything that we absorb in the gut is immediately um, uh, run through the liver right. uh, to detoxify and start, you know, this process. And that is that is that is another problem for drugs that a, a 
sometimes a large fraction of the drug is immediately uh, uh, you know uh, broken down in the liver in the right. so-called first pass liver metabolism we also don't have that problem for treating the enteric nervous system mm -hmm. and 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 that means that in principle one can use drugs that are actually quite toxic you know uh, they would be toxic to the patient if we gave it at you know a, a, if we gave it at an amount to get it into the brain because then we would need to give a whole lot get through the liver get across the blood brain barrier so so we need a lot and, and that might be too toxic right but but for treating the gut we might need only to give one percent of that sure. dose and still get a, a really good dose uh, at the enteric nervous system so you know that is you know that's kind of for, for all these reasons it is really important to for us to to be 100 percent sure that at least some patients uh, that, that the disease starts in the gut and, and and that is why you <laughs> that's why you do what you do and that's uh, extremely important and hence why the the marriage of these therapeutic interventions plus your your diagnostics and your nuclear medicine you know are so important uh, because it really allows us to uh, to achieve a much more personalized uh, approach to these things and it's, it's it's great that you you're working at the epicenter of this um, you know getting just you know a little bit more back to you now I mean it's, it's a fascinating set of research I, I really look forward to watching it um, getting back to, to Dr. Borghammer for a minute um, are there you know obviously you're you know you met a lot of people uh, and researchers and clinicians and so forth during your career to date um, are there certain people that you may want to um, shout out in terms of that have influenced you uh, to date on this path that have you know kept you interested uh, to the extent you know if it, if it wasn't for them uh, you you'd be in cosmology right now studying the universe as opposed to the <laughs> the internal universe uh, anyone that you want to give a shout out to on that front absolutely I mean I've met I've had many uh, idols uh, throughout my career so far um, uh, my my first my PhD supervisor uh, Danish neuroscientist called uh, Albert Getty okay he, he, uh, he was uh, he was a professor at Montreal and then he came back to Denmark started up the first pet center and he was he he, he was kind of this uh, you know he was he was interested in all sorts of things not 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 only you know certain disease but re really the all the mysteries of the brain and uh, no project was too crazy or too wild you know like uh, consciousness research where's god in the brain but also disease specific research and mm -hmm. i think that that kind of uh, he created an atmosphere at at, at, at the institution where I did my PhD, which was very, uh, very uh, inspiring in that way. Also, uh, 80, 90 percent of the people at the institution were foreigners, you know, mm -hmm. so which is kind of unusual in Denmark. So going to work, I spoke English all the time, even though I did my PhD <laughs> in, Den in Denmark. So, so that's that was that was fine. Um, and I, I would say that then actually then. Uh, that's my one of our current uh, uh, professors, David uh, Brooks, uh, who has been for many many years in in um, in London at Hammersmith. Uh, he's you know probably the most important uh, PET imaging researcher in in Parkinson's disease and has you know been doing that for forty years. And then he actually, by a stroke of luck, he was he actually moved to Aarhus to get a position at our department. So, uh -huh. uh, so it was kind of you know, I was a young uh, Parkinson pet researcher, and then all of a sudden, uh, the most famous uh, pet imaging researcher in the world steps through the door. Uh, so that was kind of a, a bit awe-inspiring to begin with. But I quickly realized that he was an extremely uh, gentle and nice guy, and uh, he was, uh, you know, very, or he still is, very inspiring and uh, and uh, and kind of uh, has this enormous perspective on, on on what we do. So we can always come up with great ideas. Absolutely. And then you know, I would say that uh, this this German neuropathologist Heiko Brack, uh, who kind of put into motion this whole idea 
uh, it, it, I mean, even though I've never worked with him, I mean, that is, it's one of those powerful, powerful ideas that completely transform an entire field. And, and you can kind of, you can go back to that original paper and read it again and again. And every time I read it, I find something new. Mm -hmm. So something that he had kind of prophesized 15 years ago, and, and then, and then we, we, there's these nuggets in that paper that, you know, it keeps coming true, almost everything he, he, he prophesized. I use the word prophesized, that kind of sounds a little strange, but he yeah. hypothesized, that's probably a better word. <laughs> so uh, I would say those are among my, 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 my biggest uh, inspirations. Excellent, excellent. One final question uh, before I let you go, uh, and this is the this is the science fiction question we go to on the show, and take a, take a few moments with it if you need to. This is the question about uh, who Dr. Pierre Borkhammer uh, would have wanted to meet, uh, and once again, it doesn't have to be a neuroscientist; it could be a cosmologist, it could be a philosopher, artist, whomever. But uh, if you had the chance to go in my hypothetical time machine and meet uh, a figure from the past. Uh, that uh, has fascinated you or influenced you in some way uh, for Dr. Pierre Borgheimer, who would that have been? Yeah, that's really tricky. I, I think I would have to name a, a few. But that's okay. Have a party. <laughs> yeah. that's, uh, that's okay. Have a party. Be some, of the, some of the great guys, you know, somebody like Leonardo da Vinci, it, uh, you know, this uh, spectacular multi-genius and everything he, everything he started working on, he, he made spectacular breakthroughs and simultaneously he was a brilliant artist mm -hmm. made considerable contributions to to art and developing the arts mm -hmm. and that combination is extremely fascinating uh, absolutely uh, somebody like isaac newton even though you know his biographers say that he was actually not a very uh, <laughs> kind man <laughs> but uh, uh, but still uh, it would have been interesting and certainly uh, I would have loved to to talk to Einstein, um, because you know, sitting uh, at his desk, just pen and paper, he kind of thought out an, a completely different worldview that is actually true, at least more true than what he was, what came before him. Even though it was so strange that all of us still struggle with accepting. That, that is actually the world we live in that is einstein's world uh, i mean and, and being able to being able to think that out with pen and paper is mm -hmm. is the most extraordinary uh, one of the most extraordinary human uh, uh, feats ever in my opinion absolutely i use I, I like to use those examples with my kids nowadays to show what you could get done without a tv or the internet <laughs> yeah Exactly. If you just use your brain. Dr. Borgheimer, it's, it's been a, a real pleasure and honor having you join us today and share your knowledge with us. It's, it's truly an amazing set of work and, and really wishing you uh, the best in moving it forward, as we say on the show, uh, moving the human story forward. And you're definitely uh, doing that with, with your expertise. Um, you know, once again, for everybody uh, that's going to be listening on the radio or watching uh, on the channel, we've been spending time with Dr. Pierre Borghammer, clinical professor in the Department of Clinical Medicine, Nuclear Medicine, and the PET Center at Aarhus University in Denmark, doing truly fascinating things and opening up the understanding uh, and the pathophysiology concepts behind Parkinson's disease, this, this dreaded uh, disease uh, that six million of us around the world are affected with. Uh, thank you once again so much of your time and thank you for for everything that you're doing for uh, humanity and your research well thank you it's been my pleasure <laughs>